You know, today we are on the series of messages on prayer. Last month, we tackled on the importance of the Word of God. We have to meditate, we have to soak ourselves, we have to marinate ourselves in the Word of God. And we thank God for uh, reminding us. The Lord is reminding us to go back to, uh, to, to basic. Sometimes we say, oh, it's just basic. Reading the Word of God is just basic. You know, those little things are so important. Sometimes we neglect those things. Reading the Word of God, spend time with the Lord. So today, it's just a reminder and encouragement from the Lord. So let's go back to the basic, spend time with the Word, spend time in the presence of God to soak ourselves in the presence of the Lord. So, though how busy we are, at least say, Lord, maybe I could spend two, five minutes, three minutes just to kneel down and spend time with you. It's so important to dwell in the presence of the Lord. Do we all believe that prayer is important? Amen. Can we say amen for that? Do we all believe that prayer is important in our daily walk with the Lord? Just want to make sure. I know we are, this church believes in the power of the Word of God. As a church, we believe also in the power of prayer. You know, here are some of the famous Christian leaders who emphasize on the importance of prayer. I'd like to mention all these famous Christian leaders who emphasized on the importance of prayer. Maybe you heard about Martin Luther. He said, If I should neglect prayer, but a single day, I should lose a great deal of the fire of faith. These men and women of God, they give importance on the power of prayer. He said, If I don't spend in prayer daily, I will never get my work done. If I should neglect prayer, but a single day, I should lose a great deal of the fire of faith. And this one, you, maybe you have your book, E.M. Bounce. He said, what the church needs today is not more machinery or better, not new organizations or more noble methods, but men whom the Holy Ghost can use, men of prayer, men mighty in prayer. E.M. Bounce. How many you? E.M. Bounce. It's all about prayer. It's good to read this book about prayer. And then John Bunyan said, Prayer will make a man cease from sin. Or sin will entice a man to cease from prayer. And who give importance on the power of prayer. That's why, as a church, let's continue to give importance to the power of prayer. Do you believe in the power of prayer? If you, do, if you do believe, let's continue to pray and never stop until we experience the mighty acts of God in our daily walk with the Lord. As a family, as a church, let's give importance to the power of prayer. Never stop praying because there's power as we seek God's face. Amen. It's so important to turn our eyes, to humble ourselves before the Lord, recognizing that apart from Him, we can do nothing. This man, Martin Luther, he said, I should lose a great deal of the fire of faith. If I should neglect prayer but a single day, I cannot accomplish anything. And that is very true. I myself, I could testify. I need to spend time. I need to draw myself before God, humble myself before God. Because apart from the Lord, we can do nothing. I want you to turn your Bible with me to Acts chapter 12. We will focus on this chapter, chapter 12, about prayer. That's why my, my topic for today is about, but the church. If you have your Bible, may I request everyone to please stand up as we honor, as we respect the Word of God. Acts chapter 12, start from verse 1, actually up to 17. Okay, let's read this passage. It says here, it was about this time. Take note of that. It says, it was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church intending to persecute them. 
He had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. When he saw that, his, that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. Now take note verse 5. This is the focus of our message. So Peter was kept in prison, but the Bible says, but the church was earnestly praying to God. For whom? For Peter. For him, says that. But the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, look at Peter. Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, not with one, not, not, not with one soldier, but two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentry stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up! He said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrist. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you, around you and follow me. The angel told him, Peter... Uh, Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. There's, take note, there's a first, first gate, second gate, and then there's the iron gate. Th three gates before he could uh, escape. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it when they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. And the Jewish people were anticipating to put to death, Peter to put to death. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Took at the church, they were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed. Peter's voice, she was overjoyed. She ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. You're out of your mind. They told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and describe how the Lord has brought him out of prison. Tell James, and the brothers about this, he said, and then he left for another place. Father, we thank you for, root, for, for reading the truth of your word. Father, I praise you and glorify you for what you're going to accomplish in our midst today. We just open our hearts before you as we meditate, as we ponder on your word. Lord, speak to our hearts today. Help us to realize the importance of prayer in our daily walk with you lord so today lord god as a church we just open our hearts to you speak freely lord and minister to your people today and be glorified be exalted as we study your word in jesus name we pray amen and amen now take note it says in this time verse one you could still open your Bible. It says here in this, it was about this time. Take note of that. The background of chapter 12, we have to go back to chapter 11. Okay, it says, in this time, what's the background of that, of, of that verse, verse 1? The background of chapter 12, we have to go back to chapter 11, of persecution okay the New Testament church was growing 
And moving forward, despite of the struggles, despite of the persecution, the Bible says, they were scattered. Take note of that. Chapter 11. They experienced persecution. They experienced uh, torture from the Jewish people. That's the background. So, and because of persecution, they were scattered. And in verse 20, he says, Some went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks. They went to Greek people, telling about the good news of Jesus Christ. And these people, they experienced the love of Christ, the power of the gospel. And then verse 10, 21, chapter 11, it says, The Lord's hand was with them. In fact, great numbers of people believed and turned to the Lord. The many people turn to Christ, they experience the love of Christ, they experience the power of the gospel. And in verse 26, chapter 11, disciples were called Christians. In fact, for the first time in Antioch, as they were identified with Jesus Christ, the word Christian was mentioned in Antioch. They were recognized that they were followers of the Lord Jesus Christ before they were called disciples, saints. But in Antioch, we hear the word Christian identify that these people are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why they were called Christian. It was mentioned in, in Antioch. So during the time, in verse two, in verse 1, that's why at the time of great persecution, King Herod arrested one of the foremost leaders of the Lord Jesus Christ, John, James, and Paul, and Peter. These are three men who are very close in the heart of Jesus Christ. Remember? Peter, James, and John. And during the time... During the time, King Herod arrested James, Peter, and some of the leaders of the church. As you can see, the very situation, but the church, this is the situation. I have three things I have to share with you. First, let's talk about the situation. The situation at that particular time, it was, there was a great church. They were scattered, but in spite of the struggles, in spite of the persecution, they kept on moving on, sharing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The church was moving on. Moving on, expanding the work of God, despite of the struggles. Amen? Despite of the, despite of the tortures of the Jewish people, Despite of the great persecution, they remain faithful, bringing the word of God, sharing the gospel to many people. Now let's talk about the situation in verse 1. In the previous verses, it says that particular time, the situation of the early church, I consider it as a very scary situation. Why? It's a very scary situation. Says James was put to death by King Herod. Do you think it's not a scary situation to see one of your brother put to death? Yeah. It's a very scary situation. One of the four prominent leaders in the church was arrested and put to death. That's why when I read this passage, I saw it's a very scary situation at that particular time. Because James was put to death. You know, God allowed James, the brother of John, the son of Zebedee, to die. Maybe you have some question. Why? He's very close to God. And how come God did not deliver him from the hands of King Herod? He was very close. He could deliver him on that particular time. But how come God allowed James to put to death? And Peter rescued. Have you crossed that questions in your mind? God allowed James, the 
son of Zebedee to die, and the Jews, the Jews take note of that. He proceeded to arrest Peter and put him into. Remember, when the Jewish people saw that, uh, uh, when King Herod saw that the Jews were so pleased, and when James was put to death, they were so pleased about the action of King Herod. And because of that, King Herod arrested Peter and put him into custody. And possibly plans to also put Peter to death. You know, I can a scary situation. As a matter of fact, did you know that King Herod was in the lineage of Herod the Great? That's why it's a very scary situation because this king was under the lineage of King of, of Herod the Great. Now let me tell you who's King Herod. Let's go back the historical background of this man who is King Herod. Maybe you encounter about this king. King Herod in chapter 12 is the grandson of Herod the Great. He came to that family lineage. Grandson of Herod the Great. And who is the Herod the Great? Who ruled in the days of Jesus' birth, remember? This king, the wicked king who saw the baby Jesus as a threat to his throne and wanted to murder him. He's a murderer. In fact, he killed a lot of infants because he wants this child and put him to death. In fact, one of the background of this king, of, of Herod the Great, he was a brutal man who killed his father-in-law. Several of his ten wives, he killed also his several of his ten wives, and two of his sons. He's a very wicked king. And Herod needs of Herod the Great. That's why I consider it's a very scary situation because that kind of attitude to easily kill people. In not only that, he ignored the laws of God to suit himself and chose the favor of Rome over his own people. Herod Agrippa in chapter 12 in the book of Acts was also the nephew of Herod Antipas. Who is Herod Antipas? Who had a role in mocking Jesus during his trial. Look at the lineage. No doubt. The persecution is being done because it was politically popular for Herod. It pleased many of his citizens who did not like Christians. Many political figures are ready to persecute Christians if it will make them politically popular. That's Herod Agrippa. He wants the applause of the Jews for persecuting the disciples. That's why he intends to kill Peter too. He's a politician. He wants the applause of people. You know, in America, I think even, I don't know, here in Canada, if there's a coming election, they tackle a lot of issues. They talk about, about health. They share what is their opinion about probably taxes. They talk all of this stuff. But in, during that time, because it's this, he, this king, Herod, Jewish people were so mad with Christians. That's why at the time King Herod took that opportunity to get the applause, the popularity to among these people to put all Christians. He took that opportunity. That's why the situation of the early church, it was a very scary situation under the hand of this king. He arrested James and put to death and possible Peter as well. That's Herod Agrippa. He wants the applause of the Jews for persecuting the disciples. That's why he intends to kill Peter too. A very scary situation. And also it's a very strong situation. What do I mean strong situation? Take note of the situation of Peter. It's a very tough situation. It says in verse 4, They seized Peter. 
handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers. Now take note, four, four squads of four soldiers. That is 16 soldiers. Not only four soldiers, they seized Peter. Take note of that. They arrested Peter and put him the, into custody, not only in prison, but King Herod asked four by four squads of soldiers, that is 16 soldiers, to 16 soldiers. His intention is to really put Peter into trial so that he couldn't escape. They seized Peter, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers. And not only that, Peter was sleeping between there are over him. And the Bible says, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains. Now normally, in a prisoner by his right hand to his guard's left hand. But each of Peter's hands was chained to a different guard on either side of him. Both hands were, were chained. One soldier here, another soldier here, plus 16 soldiers watching over him. And he needed to pass the three gates. It's a very tough, it's a very strong situation. And you couldn't imagine how we could escape from that kind of situation. A scary situation, a strong situation, that's what the scripture says. Herod wanted to make sure Peter cannot get away. Because in the past, in chapter 5 in the book of Acts, they had an experience. And that particular moment, probably at the back of King Herod, he said, This time, I will make it sure you cannot escape. That's why he asked four by four, 16 soldiers. Do you think it's easy situation? Scary situation? A very strong situation. But you know the good thing with this man? Peter was sleeping. <laughs> Sees. But the Bible says, he was sleeping. <laughs> How could you imagine? He knew that James was put to death. And he knew that after that trial, probably possible death. How could you imagine this man could sleep? You can sleep the night before you're sentenced to death. It's not. But how come Peter at the middle of the night, he knew tomorrow is going to put to death. But the Bible says, Peter was sleeping. Snoring probably. <laughs> you know, I think, you know, Peter had no problem with insomnia. <laughs> he could sleep even in the midst of uh, these two soldiers. <laughs> he could sleep even though he was facing a big problem. Perhaps because he did not fear for his life. Because he knew, he knew. He had that kind of trust and faith in the Lord. Kept him at peace in the midst of persecution. The very reason why he, kept, he could sleep at the middle of the night. The very reason why he could sleep in the midst of his situation. Because he had that kind of peace. Peace that passes all and does that he knew. Hallelujah. That God is able to deliver him. And I believe we have that kind of assurance. We have that kind of peace knowing that in spite of all our situation. We know and we know that we have a living God. Who could set us free who could deliver us. But there's another question. Maybe you would say, oh, what about James Pastor? How come he did not deliver him? Later on, we're going to find it in a chapter. It is, it's a very impossible situation. Just imagine. This is a no way out situation. 16 soldiers. Three gates. 
two soldiers, it's a very tough, very strong situation. Now, I want to ask you a question. Are you facing a scary situation? No way out situation today? Or probably a strong or a very tough situation in life that seems to be no way out? Are you on that kind of situation today? A very scary situation. A very strong situation. But I want you to know today, there is always a possible solution for every impossible situation. Can we say amen for that? Amen. Say that to yourself today. There is a solution for every impossible situation. Can you tell the person beside you this one? There is always a possible solution for every impossible situation. Can you say amen for that? This is the situation of Peter. This is the situation of the early church. But despite of their situation, there is always a possible solution. Hallelujah. And the Bible says, look at what, verse 5. Let's go back to verse 5. And this is the passage that I would like to focus. It says, So Peter was kept in prison, but the church... Hallelujah. But the church was earnestly praying to God for Peter. Guys, if there is a situation that is, seems impossible, there is always a possible solution. And the Bible says, But the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Guys, take note of this tiny word, but. The conjunction, but. It's so important. Despite of their situation, the situation looks desperate, but. Take note of that. It looks as though Peter might be put to death, but. It looks as though the church might be destroyed before it can carry the gospel to the world. But they were all in the face of all we were overwhelming problems. But the church, hallelujah. But the church called on to God. And the Bible says, but the church lifted up their voice in prayer. The church recognized the Lord in the midst of impossible situation. The experience, the solution that comes from the Lord. Guys, as we recognize the power of prayer, maybe you are in a very scary situation. Maybe you are facing a very, a very strong situation. But I want you to know, and I want you to know through the word of God, but the Lord delivered them. There's always a possible solution. They were all in the face of overwhelming problems, but the church, hallelujah, called on to God. They knew and they knew the best way to experience solution is to go back to God and to recognize God. And the church did it. Did it. They recognized through prayer they call upon the name of God and they said, Lord, this is the situation that we are facing as a church. This is the situation of our dear brother Peter. They called. They lifted up their voice in prayer. God heard their prayers and moved in, a might, in mighty power to bring them his, his answer. Guys, there's a solution. That's why we give importance on the power of prayer. If there's a situation, no way out, the best solution is to go back, is to go to God. Look what the, what the church did. The Bible says, but the church. It was a corporately prayer. Corporately prayed. They prayed all together, but the church, speaking the whole, the church, the body of Christ. This passage reminds us that there's power in corporate prayer. When there is a need, 
It's so important to come together as a church. If there is a problem, probably one of our brother, one of our sister, maybe if there's a problem with our nation, it's good to come together as a church. The same thing with the early church. When there is a problem, they came together, they come together and pour out their heart to God. It was a corporate kind of prayer. Remember Peter and John. In Acts chapter 4 verses 23 to 31. In verse 21 says, After further threats, they let them go. And you know what the Peter and John did? On their release, that's what the scripture says, they went back to their own people and reported everything. And in verse 24 says, When the Christians heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. They come together corporately and they poured out their heart to the Lord, seek God with all their heart. And you know what happened in verse 31? After they prayed, the place they were meeting was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Guys, there is a special experience when God's children come together. United in faith and purpose to seek the face of the Lord in prayer. There is an awesome presence. There is an awesome power that we could experience as we come together corporately as a church. That's why if there's a problem, it's good to come together. Maybe in your, in your small group, that could be your corporate prayer time. If there's a need, if there's a problem, one brother, come to go together and pray for one another. As a church, we need to come together and seek out and pour out our hearts to God. The early church, that's the solution. Corporately prayed. It's good to come together to pray as a church. Well, you can say, Pastor, I can do it privately. Yes, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong to pray privately. In fact, the Lord encourages us to pray privately. But it's also good to come together as a church. It shows that we are united. It shows that we recognize the presence of one another. And you know what the Bible says? If there's unity among the brethren, there's blessings. There's blessings. There's favor. Once God sees that we are united in prayer, corporately prayed. What else? Look at what the scripture says. But the church prayed fervently. Corporately prayed, but at the same time prayed fervently. You know, it is the picture of people pouring out their hearts in prayer before the Lord as they seek His face for their needs. And I believe this is the kind of praying we need to do together. We could come together corporately, but it's good to pray fervently. We could be together, but God wants us to come together with that kind of passion of prayer. The church prayed fervently. Now, the word fervently, you can find in James chapter 5, 6, it says, The promise of God in James 5, 6, 6 it says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man abated months. All of us here are righteous. Can we say amen for that? It is not because of our own righteousness. God made us righteous because of Christ's righteousness. When you receive Christ, God made us righteous. We are righteous in the sight of God. Not because of your own righteousness, because our own righteousness is just like a filthy rugs in the sight of God. What makes us righteous in the sight of God is the closer to God we could pour out our hearts because of Christ's righteousness that is within us God bestowed that righteousness and the Bible says look at James 5 16 the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much now the word effectual fervent refer to energetic passionate kind of prayer determine that's another word Totally dependent on God. 
God wants us to come together as a church corporately. But at the same time, as we pour out our heart to God, there shall be an eagerness determined that you want, Lord, to move in our midst. Lord, we want to experience you. That's the kind of prayer that God is looking for His people. Not the prayer that is unconcerned, half-hearted, and apathetic, not feeling for others, but instead, it is prayer that pours forth from a burdened heart. Hallelujah! And I believe the kind of prayer that moves the hand of God as He does His will upon His people. Hallelujah! The same thing with the persistent widows, remember? He kept, she kept on coming to this wicked judge. But because of his persistency, she kept on coming, she kept on calling upon this wicked judge. In, uh, at that particular time, the wicked judge listened and gave attention to her cry. Guys, let's come together as a church corporately and as we pour out our heart, let's come together with a fervent kind of prayer. Pouring out a very own heart to the needs of one brother, to the needs of one sister. And God is calling us to that kind of prayer. Hallelujah. Fervently seeking God, pouring out our hearts to the Lord. If there is a particular problem that we are facing, maybe you as, 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 as an individual, maybe your, your family as a church, it's good to, to come together and really cry out to the need of one another. Oh, the church, we have a lot of needs. Maybe one of our needs is look for, for, a, for a place. It's good to come together and fervently, Lord, desperately, Lord God, open this door for us. The moment sees, God sees our heart, that we are serious about seeking that need. God, He's not a stingy God. He's a generous God. But God wants to see us coming together with one purpose, with one heart, pouring our heart to the Lord. Say, Lord, we desperately need. We are in this kind of situation. Corporately prayed, prayed fervently. Uh, what happened? Prayed specifically for Peter. They come together. But in this moment of time, they prayed specifically for Peter. In other words, Peter was the focus of this prayer meeting. Amen. They came together to pray for a specific purpose. This was pointed prayer that sought God's power for a specific need. They focus on the need of Peter. Probably they were asking, Lord, please deliver our dear brother Peter. The focus of the prayer specifically. Are you praying? Are you how many of you are asking a specific prayer from the Lord? All of us, we have our own specific prayer. You know, it's good to pray specifically so that we could recognize that God really granted our prayers. It's good to write down, you know, my wife, she loves to write down everything, especially if there's a prayer request, if we have some request. At least we could notice, we could even, oh, look at this one. God answered this prayer. We have a lot of specific prayers that God answered. It's good to pray specifically. On this time, they focus on... You know, if we do not pray specific prayers, how will we ever know when God answers? When we ask Him for specific needs and God answers, it glorifies Him. Amen? It assures us of our relationship to Him and it increases our faith. So guys, we need to be specific in our prayers so we get specific answer. Amen? You know, my son, Iman, one time, early morning, he wake me up and said, Dad, I need a cup of, I need a glass of, uh, a, a cup of milk. Early morning, he was asking for a cup of milk. I have, as a father, although I'm, you know, I don't want to wake up on that particular time so early, but I have to wake up and then get that cup 
of glass of uh, cup of a glass of milk to my son and gave it to him. And he said, "Salamat po." As he always said, "Salamat po." He 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 he, he, he received that request. You know, sometimes it's good to say, Lord, ask us very specific prayers. We have a lot of specific prayers now, this year, 2014. A very specific prayers. And I know for sure, I could check it, say, Lord, thank you. Amen? So the church, the situation, the solution, they prayed corporately, they prayed fervently, they prayed specifically, and you know what happened? Because look at the results. God answered their prayer 6 to 17. This is the results. When they came together corporately, prayed fervently, prayed specifically, look at the, the result. God answered their prayers. Verse 7, an angel appeared, woke him up, and look what happened. Remember two soldiers? His two hands were chained under two soldiers. And the Bible says, woke him up, chains fell off without being noticed. They passed the first and second guard and came to the iron gate leading to the city. Do you think it's possible to pass these three gates with 16 soldiers watching over him? It's impossible. But how come Peter escaped from the prison? Because the Lord was with them. It was the Lord who delivered Peter. They passed the first and second guard and came to the iron gate leading to the city. And verse 11, Peter declared, I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel. Minister, you know angels are ministering spirit to help us. To protect us we have a ministering spirit angel okay and says and rescue me look at that Peter declared, I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the he from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen it was the Lord who rescued Peter why because the church prayed corporately, they prayed fervently, they prayed specifically, and the acts of God. And this is the result. This is an impossible situation, but it was the Lord who delivered. You cannot explain this one. You know, something that you could explain that's per man. But something that is unexplainable, that is an act of God. It was indeed an act of God. The result was indeed an act of God. God answered the prayers. You know, this, there's a one guy. I like to quote this one. Can you plus that one? Thomas Watson, the Puritan preacher, reported said, The angel fetched Peter out of prison. But it was prayer that fetch the angel. Amen. i like to read this one again. Thomas Watson, the Puritan preacher. The angel fetched Peter out of prison, but it was prayer that fetched the angel. Situation, solution, now like to this one. We can come together, we can pray corporately, we can pray fervently, we can pray specifically, but still the best prayer that we could do is to submit to the sovereign will of God. Maybe your question, how come the Lord did not deliver James? And how come Peter was, exp was experienced deliverance? You know, submission to the sovereign will of God is so important. There are a lot of questions we don't understand why. But still, we have to submit to the sovereignty of God. Because God is a sovereign God and He's in control of every situation. You know, I'd like to start with a story. A mother trying to teach her son to become closer to God in prayer. You know, the son asks her mom, what God is doing when I pray? 
what God is doing when I pray. You know the man, the mom said, sometimes God says yes, sometimes no, or maybe wait. Then the little boy said, I pray that God will bring me a toy that I like. You know, my mom says, maybe yes, maybe no, maybe wait. And the sons keep on, uh, keep on asking questions. I pray that God would magically clean my room. And the mom said, maybe yes, no, and maybe wait. And another said, I prayed that God would strike down my brother because he's so annoying. Probably that's no. <laughs> your room today? Did you clean your room today? And the son said, maybe yes, maybe no, maybe wait. You know, then the little boy got hungry. Mom, mom, is dinner ready? I'm hungry now. The mom said, maybe yes, maybe no, maybe wait. You know, we have to submit our prayer to him. God may answer our prayer yes. God may answer our prayer no or wait. But still we have to submit to the sovereign will of God. I remember the three Hebrew friends in Daniel chapter 3 verse 16 to 18. It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. He said, they said, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve, they have that assurance. They said, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will, they said. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Submission to the sovereign will of God. You know, since God is almighty, we have, we have that kind of theology. We believe that God is almighty, amen? And we believe that nothing is too hard from the Lord. Nothing is too difficult from the Lord. Since God is almighty, you know, He can easily deliver His servants from humanly impossible situations according to His will. He could do that. He could deliver James if He wants. God could easily have spared James if it had been His will. He could do that. No prison can shut God out or keep his servants in if he wills to free them. No one. You know, it was no big deal to God to get Peter out of the most secure prison that Herod could advise. According to his will, he did it. In human perspective, you cannot imagine how calm Peter could experience escape. From that strong prison with 16 soldiers. But because it's the plan of God to set him free. When God opens the door, no one could close it. If God closed that door, no one could close it. But still, we have to submit to the sovereign will of God. I believe this is what we seek in our prayers. Our submission to the sovereign will of God. You know, the writer of the book of Hebrews commended the heroes of faith for their submission to the sovereign will of God. Hebrews 11, 32 to 37. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms administered justice and gain what was promised. But in verse 35, letter B says, But there were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Guys, God is sovereign. His ways are perfect. And He knows what's best for us. And so we submit. Submit to the sovereign will of God. Sometimes we don't understand why God did not answer our prayer. Sometimes yes. Sometimes no. Sometimes wait. 
Now, the greatest example of prayer is the prayer of our Savior Jesus in Matthew 26 to 39 says, He said, My Father, my Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. That's his prayer. Yet not as I will, but as you will. That's how our prayer shall always be. Your will be done, Lord. Your will be done, Lord. We submit to your sovereign will. Maybe your answer is yes, praise the Lord. Maybe your answer is no, still praise the Lord. Maybe your answer is to wait. Still, I want to worship you, Lord. Your will be done. And I'd like to end with this conclusion. In every situation, there is a solution. As you submit to the sovereign will of God. As an individual, as a family, as a church. I don't know what you're facing right now. In every situation, always remember, there's a solution as we submit to the sovereign will of God. Are you to the sovereign will of God for your life, for your family, the church?